Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. I do a lot of videos on theories of everything, uh, magnum opuses from obscure authors, researchers, uh, people who have spent their whole life working on something uh, that is all-encompassing, um, cosmologies, things of that nature. And uh, today is our 367th video about uh, the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. And this one is a little bit tangential. Um, it's written from uh, by uh, Dr. Bruce Perrett, uh, who, uh, w when he was alive, was... Um, of writing sometimes under the uh, pen name of Daniel Phoenix Three, and uh, Daniel was uh, claimed to be a person that worked on the Montauk Project uh, out on Long Island back in the in the early eighties. It was a government black ops uh, time travel project that went awry. Um, and uh, there were people there uh, that you may have heard of, like Al Bielik and Duncan Cameron. Um, and uh, Daniel was supposed to have been one of the um, com young com computer programmers there. But then he also became an adherent of uh, Dewey B. Larson's reciprocal system. And so when he writes under the name of Daniel, he tends to... Uh, focus on more speculative uh, things, things that maybe aren't uh, so right down the middle uh, reciprocal system, but maybe have some kind of reciprocal system content, and or at least in the spirit of the reciprocal system. Now, what is the reciprocal system? This is a system that uh, was that Dewey Larson uh, derived over the course of his lifetime. Uh, he came out uh, with his two fundamental postulates in the late 1950s, uh, which kind of state the case. Uh, the first one uh, specifically says that uh, the universe is composed of one, uh, one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. So uh, basically, you know, the universe is made out of motion. Motion is the relationship between space and time. But it's not any old normal kind of motion. It is what Larson calls a scalar motion. A scalar motion is one that has a magnitude but no specific direction and can be envis envisioned using a balloon with dots on it. If you blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other but they're not moving in any specific direction. Um, it's really like th the, the balloon itself is expanding. Space itself is expanding. Larson refers to that as clock, uh, clock space. Along with clock time, the clock is always getting later and later and later. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart, but in no specific direction. Um, time and space also have three dimensions, um, and uh, XYZ coordinates in space. Larson calls that coordinate space and coordinate time, and they come in discrete units. There is a minimum unit of space, a minimum unit of time, and therefore a minimum unit of motion. Motion is basically a fraction with time or space as the numerator, space or time as the denominator. If you have one unit of space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light, which Larson refers to as unit speed. Unit speed is basically the background or the at rest or zero point state of this universe of motion. If you have a universe of motion, you have motion before you have anything else. You have to be able to conceive of motion without anything moving. Motion is the thing that is moving. Um, and, um, you know, you have to be able to kind of accept that paradigm. Larson took his uh, 
fundamental postulate, and the other, the second one has more to do with just fu fundamentals of math and geometry. And he uh, designed, it, uh, derived through a process of deduction, a theoretical universe of how the universe would look if his postulates were correct. And then he eventually compared his theoretical universe to that of, that the uh, legacy scientists had measured in their laboratories and so on. And um, he was able to really derive a universe that looks a whole lot like the universe that we live in. Uh, and so he, I think, obviously was onto something with his idea of scalar motion uh, being the main component of the universe. Now, Daniel is uh, writing in this paper, and he doesn't refer too much to the reciprocal system, but he does. But it's, it's more uh, just about kind of the spirit of the reciprocal system that I um, am liking about this ar uh, article. It's called, The Mind Has No Firewall. In my paper, New World Religion, I commented on the fact that the mind has no firewall, stating that our minds, those lumps of gray matter that run our body and life, have no protection against a number of non-biological viruses, such as subliminal programming, suggestion, behavior modification, and even active mind control. Our computers, however, have very extensive firewalls that block out all these unwanted intrusions from other computers on the internet. If we were only that careful with our own minds, then the powers that be would be out of a job because they could not influence the masses to the extent they do to stay in power. And they put a great deal of time and effort into it. A reader of that paper suggested that I should expound on this topic as a blog entry. Here he's quoting Mark Twain. All you need in this life is ignorance and confidence. Then success is sure. They say knowledge is power and ignorance is bliss. And I have come to notice that humanity in general seeks happiness more than anything else and is all too willing to sacrifice knowledge for that blissful ignorance. And that bliss takes many forms. It does not take a lot of effort to trace all these provider bliss systems back to our very own governments, the class of Anunnaki descended nobles that rule the world. And those systems include smoking, drinking, recreational drugs, charity, religious devotion, political power, and corporate, corporate power. It's quite a long list and now includes iPhones, freemium apps, music players, and all sorts of electronic devices. But no surprise there because like their blue blood ancestors, they want controllable slaves, not an evolving species. Most people treat this as a personal choice between master and slave. Granted, there are those that desire slavery and a surprising number of people want someone telling them what to do, where to go and how to think. Free will and independence is being bred out of humanity bit by bit. What I find frightening is that creativity, imagination, and hope for a better future are going along with it. But it isn't a situation of either you're with us or against us, because there is an alternative to rivalry, this little thing called rapport. Being a science fiction buff, I grew up with classic 50s sci-fi, where all sorts of new ideas and inventions were being presented, sometimes with dire consequences that made mankind reflect on the choices behind his decisions. Was it either, or, sorry, was it ethics or ego? 
And those classic the end messages had a positive effect on us kids of the time, making us think twice about what we did and why we were doing it. I've noticed how science fiction has changed since then. Take a series like The Outer Limits or The Twilight Zone with their thought-provoking storylines that reached right into the core of your unconscious. By today's standards, many of those stories are slow to get going, but when they do, they reach out and grab you and you're no longer in the living room, but right there with the characters, experiencing situations as they do. I still won't watch the Outer Limits episode Wolf 359 after sunset. But these days, films, or movies as we call them, are nothing more than the producer playing a video game while the characters run, jump, and shoot, and try to defeat simple challenges on their quest. I mention this because good writing is a kind of mind control that opens doors in the mind, invoking a sense of curiosity and wonder, and engenders that rapport of the peaceful explorer of the universe. Bad writing, however, closes those doors, not because it is bad, but because it makes readers not want to read at all, to find the good writing. The masters of this world have learned how to engage their mental firewalls to protect themselves from the very propaganda they, shoved, they shovel out on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The slaves, however, have been trained over the years, of, over the course of their lives, on how to keep those firewalls shut down under the guise of more bliss off than on. The remainder of this post is a description on how the mental firewall works. So if you desire ignorance is bliss, then stop reading now. For those that do not want to end up face down in the gravel, the first step to a solution is to clearly identify the problem. Unlike our rulers that come up with a solution, then create a problem to implement it. So the problem is, how do I become conscious of the influence of others? The remote control of the human mind has been a popular and much sought after topic of the rich and famous for centuries. And in order to discover what they found out, all one has to do is to look in the places they don't want you to look namely all the psychology that they poo-poo and call nonsense. While scarfing up those very books and papers for themselves. With a little pre 20th century research, one big area stands out, mesmerism. The research of one Franz Mesmer, 1734 to 1815, of the energetic transfers between life, the universe, and everything. If you notice the comments surrounding mesmerism, like the dictionary comment, he made a living at mesmerism and the selling of medical remedies of dubious value you'll find they are actually using his techniques to make you dubious of the topic itself through association with well-known medical cons. This is one of their favorite techniques because they can claim, I never said mesmerism was dubious because technically they didn't, 
but that word and is a logical association. Both must be true for the statement to be true. And the statement is presented as truth. So your mind does the logic and assumes both premises must be true. It's basic logic and the brain is logical. Mesmer is basically the root of the mind control tree. There were others before him, but their works are not well known, not easy to obtain. I would suggest you do a little research on mesmerism and get the general idea behind animal magnetism. Because you will soon realize that this magical magnetic fluid they speak of is etheric. It exists in three-dimensional time. The reciprocal system's cosmic sector or the soul of the living organism. Now, uh, just to interrupt, in the reciprocal system, you know, you have your speed of light boundary, and so you have half the universe is moving faster than the speed of light. That is what Larson calls the cosmic sector. And the cosmic sector has relationships based on three-dimensional time and progressing space. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. Um, and in Larson's system, life is basically the combination of a material sector, slower than the speed of light, uh, a material sector unit, and a cosmic sector unit. The cosmic unit is called a control unit, and the cosmic unit comes to control the body. So the cosmic unit is really uh, what he calls the soul. Uh, it, but uh, in other contexts, it's called the mind. And uh, the material sector is the body. So the body is controlled by a mind, um, or what Perret calls a soul. And this creates what he calls the life unit. Uh, and so that is, that now they have to be combined um, in the right proportions and at the right, in the right phase. Because normally a cosmic sector um, entity and a material sector entity will annihilate each other. But if they are in the right configuration at the right um, proportions, then they turn into an explosion of life. Okay. Once you understand uh, that the etheric or the magnetic fluid exists in three-dimensional time in the reciprocal system's cosmic sector or the soul of the living organism, once you understand that, you will understand what Mesmer discovered. In the mid-1800s, um, Mesmerism evolved into a field of study known as etherology, having recognized the etheric effects at work in Mesmerism and the science of Freno philosophy. A comparison study of Mesmerism and magic delving into hypnosis, sleep learning, and of general consciousness. If you do not mind 19th century writing style, there is an excellent public domain book available by J. Stanley Grimes with the humongous title of Etherology and the Freno Philosophy of Mesmerism and Magic, Eloquence, including a new philosophy of sleep and of consciousness with a review of the pretensions of freno magnetism, electrobiology, etc. And this book came out in, 19, in 1850. If you desire to learn the fundamental concept of, of concepts of how your mind is controlled, then read Etherology. Granted, it is written on the premises of 19th century science 
before they poo-pooed the concept of the ether. So it is not an easy read, but it is a fascinating one. Just the comment on the title page says a great deal to me personally. Quote, all the known phenomena of the universe may be referred to three general principles. That is matter, motion, and consciousness. These folks understood a century before Dewey Larson did these simple underlying principles. The modern interpretation of these principles tends to lump together under the concept of neurolinguistic programming or NLP, as it is called, makes use of the brain's phenomenal ability to recognize patterns and, like many of Darren Brown's tricks, pre-programs responses to these patterns so by the time you figure it out, you already have the solution that was given to you, that was given you, and are amazed. I love Darren Brown's series. Much can be learned if you pay close attention to what he does and understand that most of the time he is telling his mark how to respond rather than letting them make a choice for themselves. We are constantly exposed to NLP through marketing departments, by their visual advertisements, and commercials. What they program you to do is much like the dubious situation above. They take two unrelated concepts and create a logical connection between them. So one infers the other. The most common is sex plus product equals you get sex if you buy this product. They are going after that animal magnetism of Mesmer. What a surprise that they don't want people studying it, as they might recognize the trickery. This short post is the basis of how to become conscious of the unconscious influences that bombard our consciousness almost nonstop. It is embedded in every television show, commercial, film, movie, computer game, app, and even the music you listen to. Watch for product branding, where they stick product names in obvious places during a show, but never actually mention it. You like the star of the show, the star likes product X, so therefore you must like it, and if you like it, you'll find yourself just dropping it into the cart without even thinking about it as you've been programmed to know you already like it. The mind does have a firewall, but it is not something you can go out and purchase at Walmart. You need to do the work to become conscious of how you are being manipulated by getting the fundamentals of how your mind works and how it is being manipulated. Then you can catch them in the act. And each time you do, you'll find it is easier to catch them again. Okay, that is the end of this paper, The Mind Has No Firewall by Daniel Phoenix 3, otherwise known as Dr. Bruce Perret. Um, and yeah, um, you know, mind control is very powerful, uh, now, especially, you know, in the freedom movement, I think that, you know, the truther movement, uh, people are pretty up on the kind of programming and mind control that goes on in the media, the news, you know, the TV shows and movies, all of the subliminals and the, you know, telling them, telling us what they're going to do before they do it. And, but I'm actually just kind of blown away how people who have been red pilled, who, who think that they, they've uh, been red pilled and who, uh, you know, dig and, and dig to, uh, go down rabbit holes 
about how so and so is a member of the World Economic Forum or how so and so is uh, trying to do this and that to us, but they won't look at their holy books. They will, you know, I mean, their holy books are full of propaganda and, and they're, I, I mean, all of them, they're obviously um, mind control. They're obviously attempting to get us to, um, you know, react in a certain way about a certain thing. And uh, their history is utterly dubious. And if you do just a modicum of research, it all falls apart like a house of cards. But they, a lot of these truthers will go to bat for their religion and they will, you know, it's like uh, some of these religious books, I, I've read them. I, I've read them, but I read them late in my life after I, you know, became so-called red-pilled. And some of them, you know, I'm reading them and it's just like, you expect me to believe this? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. This is just totally obviously um, programming, propaganda. It ha it, it's got clear motives, uh, clearly, it's, it's, it's so obvious. And I just don't see how people can, you know, be red-pilled about certain things and then see other things and just be oblivious to uh, the, same, the same patterns. You know, I mean, I, I study a lot of different things and, you know, I've chosen certain things that are things that I believe in more than others, but nothing is sacrosanct, nothing is above scrutiny. You have to, you know, there might be things that you're like, okay, well, this makes sense, but this doesn't. Or, you know, there's some um, controlled opposition going on here. And so they're telling you the truth about 80% of it, but, you know, you can't really trust this source or whatever. Everybody um, is not above scrutiny and it's almost you know it, it causes me to lose faith in the truther movement uh, because they are so um, infiltrated with people who are adamant uh, to be pushing their religion on you um, even at the same time that they see the programming involved in everything else. So anyway, just my uh, two cents on that. And uh, so tomorrow we're going to come back and I think we're going to look at another paper from Daniel um, having to do with space travel. But uh, I might find something more interesting than that. Oh, well, it's pretty interesting. But um, I might find something by tomorrow. But uh, I think that's what we're going to go with tomorrow. And I uh, hope you uh, got something out of this one today. And thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.